Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. As we've just seen in this case, it's very difficult to commit the perfect murder. It's difficult to remove absolutely all traces when some traces left behind can be invisible or almost invisible even to the perpetrator. Now, I hardly think that this particular case qualifies as can, sort of a candidate case for the perfect murder. I mean, we are dealing with people who told many other people around them that people would die, that someone was a zombie, that they'd had visions or dreams, and none of that really qualifies as the sort of stealth that's required for a perfect murder. But in terms of the actual commission of the murder, um, if we look at the uh, Laurie Vallow case and the attempts possibly to get away with something, you kind of have a hair, something that's invisible that comes back possibly to haunt the perpetrator or possible perpetrator. In the Scott Peterson case, and by the way, I've just driven past Modesto last night um, from San Francisco to a Thousand Oaks. So I was in that neck of the woods. Um, But in terms of that case, virtually the only evidence found of Lacey anywhere was a single hair in a pair of needle nose pliers found inside Scott Peterson's boat. I've written three books on that case. In terms of the murder of Tammy Day Bell, Chad may have felt that quickly burying her body, you know, if he was involved or or burying it without an autopsy, uh, perhaps he thought that would be sufficient to cover up any evidence. But there is a unique piece of evidence we tend to see in manual strangulation scenarios. And as far as I know, that has not been discussed in this case. Maybe it'll be discussed in the Chad Day Bell case. Before we get to that, uh, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. Uh, by the way, I'm in a, th- a Thousand Oaks after being in the Avenue of the Giants and the sort of Redwood areas. I'm now about 50 miles north of Los Angeles, and I should be here for a couple of days, and so that should allow me to post more regular content for the next week or so. So look out for that. If you're enjoying this episode, please like, share, leave a comment. Uh, you can also hit the thanks button. I'm hoping to do a live within the next day or two. So hopefully I'll see you guys. Um, I'll let you know more about that closer to the time. And let's get started. So let's have a look at the evidence that was excluded. Now, uh, originally, and if we go back to uh, April 25th, 2022, around about a year ago, Fox News, Fox 10 Phoenix was reporting that the Fremont County Coroner, Brenda Dye, that's D-Y-E, listed Tammy Daybell's immediate course of death as a cardiac event. <clears throat> and she named pulmonary edema as the condition that led to her death. So basically that she died of a heart attack as a result of some kind of lung issue, I guess. And the date of her death was obviously October 19, 2019. Those numbers quite interesting as well. 19, 10, 20, 19. Anyway, the initial cause of death, as I say, was said to be a cardiac event. And although it seems Chad may have told the medical examiner that he thought Tammy had had a seizure, the problem was that, you know, um, people, although Chad may have been used to people taking his word at face value, The problem was that when you looked at Tammy's prior medical history, that she she didn't have any kind of history of any of these sort of things, no seizures, no cardiac, no heart problems. I even asked, um, I spoke to Tammy's aunt about her health, uh, you know, was she a marathon? And she said, no, she did run 5Ks and things like that. But um, what was the other thing? Uh, I know during the the trial in the last couple of days, they've been looking at her Fitbit and just how active she was. And so there's no signs that her health was in jeopardy or deteriorating. One way that they determined that was looking at her Fitbit 
um, status and movement and activity and comparing it to the same period, I think, in the previous year. And although she, her year had gotten off to a slowish start, it was picking up and it was run about normal by the time that she died. So, so no signs of slowing down, in fact, the opposite. Now, at one point, I had, like many of you, I, I'd, considered the, I'd considered sedatives or poison a possibility. Because bear in mind, even if you're trying to strangle someone, it's, it's, a, it's a life and death contest. And Tammy was a healthy young woman, a lot like Shanann Watts. And so the perpetrator would want to gain, get or gain some sort of advantage, whether it's the advantage of the first move advantage, surprise, or, as I say, sedatives that undermine the victim. But although that seemed possible and also likely, it's clear now that the toxicology and extensive bruising uh, seems to have excluded this possibility. Lauren Steinbrecher from, um, I'm not sure which news channel, I think it's KSL5 TV. Um, on the 1st of May, she was saying that we're finally getting an explanation for the pink foam that was found coming from Tammy when she died, pulmonary edema, fluid leaks into the capillaries, the airway and causes bubbly froth. And this can happen as a result of asphyxiation. She also refers to Dr. Christensen explaining where he found the bruising on Tammy and that he felt that it was consistent with being restrained. The upper right arm over the lateral biceps and triceps, the right forearm, forearm, the left side of the chest, the left arm over the biceps. What is missing from this picture? Well, no bruising to the neck, no bruising to the throat, no bruising to the face. So how do we account for that? And so really the question we're asking is, how was Tammy murdered? If she was asphyxiated, how do you asphyxiate someone without bruising the, um, the area that's being asphyxiated, which is the neck, throat, um, mouth, sort of lips area, jaw, all of that sort of thing. And you may remember with Shanann Watts that she did have some injuries to... Her, uh, her jaw area. So the, um, the pink foam is associated with um, high altitude mountain climbers as well. So you get the same thing with them where they simply aren't able to breathe at high altitude. Their lungs uh, basically start bleeding. And so, so that is basically what you're thinking about. But you need to think about it also in terms of injury to the lungs. So according to um, this article by, let's just see who published it, is it, I think it's from the New York Post, quote, bruises consistent with being restrained were discovered on the arms and chest of Tammy Day Bell. So you kind of get the sense that her arms were restrained, her chest was had pressure on it, perhaps from knees or, or something like that, someone sitting on her. And so why is there no injury to the face and neck? And I think we, we, there's a possible answer to that. Doctors determine that a cause of death is a diagnosis of exclusion uh, or a medical condition reached by a process of elimination. And then the article goes on to say, while a person can die naturally of asphyxia after seizure or heart arrhythmia, Christensen said that both would be unusual for a woman of Tammy Daybell's age and health. And of course, Chad wants you to believe that this unusual thing happened. Chad Daybell told the coroner that, that Tammy had suffered from something like a seizure, but Christensen said that there was nothing in her medical records to suggest she had. And so we can say what likely didn't happen, but then what did happen? So if Tammy was asphyxiated, does that mean she was strangled? Was she smothered? If she was strangled, was it manual strangulation or ligature strangulation? Manual is with the hands, ligature is with something like a tie or a rope or a cord. Now, the absence of bruises on her neck, jaw and face, as, as I mentioned earlier, that actually suggests she wasn't manually strangled. So, 
Asphyxiated, yes, but manually strangled, no. And so let's think about it in a little bit more of a wider context. Let's just sort of pull out slightly. So the context of the crime at night on a bed, so late at night on a bed, suggests a pillow may have been used to smother her perhaps while sitting on top of her. Does that make sense? So, and this brings us to the critical clue that I want to share with you guys. The critical clue to look out for here is the hyoid bone. The hyoid bone, it's spelled H-Y-O-I-D, floats in the neck area. It's kind of not so much a bone as a sort of bendy cartilage. And it's actually an, an amazing um, structure that, um, that we have in the human body. It's sort of a bone that's not attached to anything. And it's typically damaged in some way. It's either bruised or broken because it, in a way it's a little bit like the wishbone of a chicken. It's, it's got that sort of fle flexibility. Um, it, it gets bruised or broken during a manual strangulation event because it's got nowhere to go. It can't slip upwards. It can't move downwards. And so because it can't escape, the, these hands that are you know encircling the throat um, when force is applied it, it can be damaged in a and bear in mind also the victim is sort of um, writhing and struggling against that forceful um, effort that forceful application that that forceful hold in terms of a ligature situation such as a hanging situation or, or using some kind of um, you know, like a um, cord of a, um, you know, like a wire cord or something like that. Um, what typically happens is the ligature moves up towards the jaw, and that means that the hyoid bone is kind of unaffected. And, and in a situation with ligature strangulation, the hyoid isn't damaged. And we saw that in the Rebecca Zahao case. And so uh, the hyoid bone being damaged is a idiosyncratic artifact of manual strangulation. So in other words, when you see a damaged hyoid bone, it tends to show manual strangulation. And I would imagine that you don't see that in this case. So if there's no damage to Tammy's hyoid bone, I would expect it to be a smothering scenario or a ligature scenario. But because there's no bruising to her neck or throat or jaw, it it all that is left is uh, all that is left. The likeliest thing is a smothering scenario, and so this would account for why um, Chad mentioned sounds that Tammy made at the time of her death, that she would otherwise be less capable or incapable of making in a ligature or manual strangulation scenario. If you want to think about what I'm talking about, you may recall the scene in Gladiator where. Commodus um, smothers his father by basically holding his father's face, crushing his father's face essentially against his, um, I think his abdomen, against his, his own coat that he's wearing. And you sort of hear the muffled sounds of his father struggling to breathe. It's quite a disturbing scene. But that's in a way what you're talking about here. According to the article, uh, Chad Debel also told the coroner that Lori, that sorry, that Tammy had been coughing and vomiting throughout the night, and that her torso and head had fallen off the bed at five forty a.m. That's the time of death that he, or the time that he seemed to believe that this happened. But that is something else that's fishy about Chad's version of events. It's the sketchy time of death. Rigor and cooling of the body seem to indicate Tammy Daybell died much earlier. You know, as much as five hours before that at about 30 minutes past midnight or um, maybe as late as 2.30 a.m., which is still three hours earlier than he said. And if, that, if that's the case, you wonder how Chad would lie beside her and not know something was wrong for hours on end. In other words, if uh, Tammy killed, if Tammy was killed by Chad and much earlier in the night, where was Chad for the rest of that night? The other thing is, if she fell off the bed and he didn't notice, 
for as many as six hours, one would find that unlikely and hence suspicious. So obviously if she died at or near the time Chad woke up, that would mean he was off the hook. Oh, I woke up and she was lying off the bed. I, I didn't do anything. Something happened while she was sleeping. That, that's his story. Is it believable? Will his jury believe that? So I think a pillow over her head would be a, a tricky way of killing someone because especially someone relatively young, especially someone relatively fit and healthy as Tammy was. And so clearly one has a sense that Tammy did fight back. And the, these bruises on her arms are the result. Um, she's got a pillow over her face and she's trying to um, get rid of the perpetrator and all that she's got to work with are really her arms. And that is where she's getting injured by other arms that are kind of you know, pushing them down or pinning her down. And so it would be interesting to have checked Chad for any kind of bruises or injuries at the time of Tammy's death. I wonder if they did. Maybe we'll find out in his trial. Um, she... She made sounds, we know that she made sounds, or we can assume that she made sounds based on this reference Chad made to coughing and vomiting, both of which are sounds of a sort as well. Of course, only a killer would know exactly what the sounds Tammy made or what they sounded like. We know that Lori Vallow married Chad Daybell in Hawaii less than three weeks after Tammy was killed. So I'm not going to take it further than that. I hope you found this analysis interesting. Um, and uh, I'll obviously be doing a little bit more. There's some news in the Murdoch case now as well. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you guys next time. What makes you think? Being a good mom is very important to me, and a good wife, and a good worker, and being all those things together is not easy. So I'm basically a ticking time bomb. <laughs>